of the worst nights of my life was December 28th, 2013. To put it bluntly, and in as few words as possible, a tough Christmas had been rough on my mental health. Then a straight up shouting match with my mom just kind of finished me off. I stormed out of our family home, screaming profanity and swearing that they'd never see me again. Yep, I was that petulant teenager. Sure, I'd forgotten my phone and wallet, but was I way too proud to go back and get them? You bet I was. So in my fit of only partially warranted rage, I somehow decided it would be a good idea to try to hitchhike to my friend's house so I could stay the night there. I had never hitchhiked before. I don't think I'd even held my thumb out for a cab at this point in my life. But there I was, stood on a stretch of Florida highway trying to catch the attention of a passing driver. To my surprise, someone actually pulled over pretty quickly, and not the hippie bus rust bucket I'd been visualizing either. It was one of those high-end Chevys, I'm not sure which model, and the guy behind the wheel looked like he had a few dollars. I mean, he was the archetypical rich dad type, absolutely nothing to indicate that he was anything but nice and well-meaning. Hop in, he calls out from the open passenger window. I couldn't believe my luck. Like, not only was I about to actually hitchhike for the first time, which felt pretty cool, not gonna lie, but I was about to do it in style. I can't tell the difference between faux leather and the real deal, but when you're in an air-conditioned sedan that still has that new car smell at 17, who cares? You feel as grown up as you can. So the guy asked me why I'm hitchhiking, and I'll be honest, I may have given him a totally hopped-up version of events which totally made me out to be the victim. Abusive parents, poor me, blah blah blah. Naturally he takes this as gospel and starts telling me how his father was an alcoholic, how he sympathized with my situation. I asked him to take me as far down the road as he could, and that I had a friend that lived about 30 minutes drive away. He says cool and down the highway we go. As he's driving, we talk a lot more about family. He pops the glove box and boom, there's a picture of his kids. As I'm looking at his little girls, he starts telling me how important he thinks family is, especially to those of us that come from less than stable backgrounds. Then he said something that seemed completely out of character. We're pulling into a gas station after he mentions needing to fill up, continuing the family convo in segments if that makes any sense. One minute he'll stop talking because he needs to focus on a turn or a lane switch, then he carries on. So it was almost out of nowhere when he says something like, we have to protect our families from our true natures. I didn't know what to say to that. Not in the moment, so I just kind of stayed quiet as he gets out of the car and starts filling up the tank. I had a few minutes to process those words, and the more I thought about them, the more I realized that hitchhiking might not have been such a good idea. When he gets back in after paying for the gas, there's a few moments of quiet as I'm still trying to work out just what he meant by his last statement. So I just asked. I straight up asked him what he meant by something so ominous. It'll be easier if I show you. Ever wonder what it would feel like to tuck and roll out of a moving vehicle? Ever try to imagine it because you're literally about to do it and you're pretty sure it'd kill you at the speeds you're traveling? Probably not. I hadn't. Not until that moment right there. But somehow I convinced myself that I was just being overly dramatic. Too little too late, huh? So I just stayed in the car. I didn't even ask for him to pull over or anything. Christ, looking back at it, I wasn't sure what was going through my head at all. Just that I really, really didn't want to be around this guy anymore. He'd gone from nice and normal to moody and creepy in light speed. You know, everyone has secrets. He says after pulling into a dark commercial lot and shutting the engine off. So imagine that line spoken as creepily as you can imagine, then double it, and that's what this guy sounded like. I had kept my tone polite up until that point, like I needed this dude to get to my friend's house, but, but I was all out of cool by then, and I'm literally about to ask him what he's talking about. When he puts his hand on my thigh, doesn't just put it there, he puts his hand there and squeezes. Little side note here, I am not in the least bit homophobic, 
An older cousin of mine came out as gay long before this ever happened, and aside from a great uncle whose mentality seems to be firmly rooted in the 1920s, everyone in the family just accepted him for who he is. So this isn't me like, oh god, it was scary because a gay dude touched me, because really I don't think this guy was even gay. Like I said, he had pictures of his kid, mentioned his wife, even complained about his in-laws a little during our little family talk. Not that that rules out him being in the closet. Look, what I'm trying to say is, he did what he did because he was a predator. He saw someone vulnerable, he apparently had a rough childhood or family background, and saw someone he could manipulate. It was the look in his eyes, man. Not this vulnerable I like you look. It was like a hunger. That's the only way I can describe it like an excitement before a feast. I just hit him. I'm not some tough guy. I don't do MMA. I don't think I've even landed the punch properly, but but I threw it hard enough to let him know that he was not about to have his way with me in a dark parking lot in the middle of winter. Then I tried to undo my seatbelt. Tried being the operative word. I pushed a little red button and absolutely nothing happened. No clicking or catching of mechanisms. Nothing. He should have seen this guy smile when that happened. I will never, ever forget that look in his eye. Pure predator. I'm not even ashamed to admit that I started screaming for help like a little kid. But ever have a nightmare where you try to scream but your voice keeps kind of catching in your throat? It's so scary because it can literally happen. And it happened to me right there in that dark parking lot. I'm not even entirely sure what happened next. I remember slamming my fist into the glass window and it popping all over me. I know I must have gotten the door open somehow, too. There were headlights behind us, someone shouting as they intervened. The predatory driver reached under his seat and I thought for a moment that he was about to pull out a gun or something, but then the seatbelt felt kind of loose, so I just kind of rolled out of the car as it sped away. In retrospect, I think the guy had a way to unbuckle it like jury-rigged under his seat, if that makes any sense. I mean, it was incredibly tight, and then it just wasn't. Then the cops are there. My rescuer must have called, and I'm just numb. Not only because I couldn't believe I'd almost gotten myself kidnapped or whatever. I mean, I have no idea what that guy was planning for me, other than it wasn't good or innocent. But it was the fact that my own foolish pride... My own self-pity and lies could have been the things really responsible for what could have easily happened, an untimely death. Hi Reddit, my name is Rory Benet, I'm just outside of Edinburgh, and I once hitchhiked across America from Savannah and Georgia to Los Angeles out in California. This was back in the late 90s, just after I'd graduated from uni, but long before I'd settled on any kind of career path. It was honestly one of the best, most enriching experiences of my life. I met people I stay in touch with, even to this day. But it also happened to include one of the most terrifying events I'd ever endured. And although it didn't quite put me off to hitchhiking... It certainly made me think twice about whose car I would or wouldn't be climbing into on some lonely stretch of road. Like I said, I started off on the Georgia coast, making my way through Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. I had a heck of a time in Texas. Austin, in particular, was much more bohemian than I'd ever thought possible for the Lone Star State. But eventually I found myself in the state of Arizona, which is where my story takes place. I remember I had thumbed a lift with a friendly truck driver who was taking the I-10 from Tucson to Phoenix. But since the road I wanted was the I-8, which would take me into California, we had to part ways just after Arizona City. But as it turned out, Arizona City is anything but an actual city. With a population of only 10,000 and with a main street that consisted of little more than five stores, no offense to anyone who lived or lives there, but... It was not the teeming metropolis I had imagined. So I decided to just bite the bullet and get back on the road again. The sooner I made it out to San Diego, the sooner I could be soaking up the sun of golden sand beaches. Only, that was a huge mistake. The sun was beginning to set as I walked up towards I-8 in preparation to thumb a lift. 
As normally happens when hitchhiking, a fair few cars drove past me without so much as a look. But eventually my patience was rewarded, and someone slowed to a stop just past me. Now a little side note here, I've found myself in some despicably unclean vehicles before now. On many an occasion, I've jumped into the passenger side of a truck or van only to discover that the interior is filthy, stinking, or both. It's not pleasant, but it's just one of those things you have to put up with if you choose to hitchhike. Only this particular car that stopped at the edge of the road for me was gleaming. As I approached the car's rear, I could tell it was either brand new or the owner took a great deal of pride in its appearance. Either way, I was pretty excited at the prospect of luxury transportation, especially since I'd previously ridden in some real stinkers. Hey man, need a ride? The driver asked as I drew level with the window. Two sharply dressed men occupy the driver's and passenger seat, not usually the kind of people that stop for hitchhikers, but you weren't about to catch me complaining. I told them yes, opened the car's rear door, and climbed in before they drove away. The first thing the driver brought up was my accent, asking where I was from. I told him I was from Scotland, traveling the southern U.S. as part of my gap year. You ever been to Mexico? He then asked me. I told him no, but that I'd always wanted to visit, that maybe if I found a job in California, I could pop over the border for a day or two. It's a beautiful country, he told me. My people are from down there. Beautiful place, but crazy, you know? He and his passenger gave a knowing laugh, one I found a little unnerving. It was around then that the two guys in front of me began to speak Spanish. It hit me pretty fast that they were talking in Spanish under the assumption that I didn't speak any, but that simply was not the case. I'd done a few years of basic Spanish in secondary school, and although my grasp of the Mexican dialect wasn't concrete, I could still make out a few words here and there. But it was only when I heard the words... Podemos usarlo, but I began to get seriously nervous. That phrase means something along the lines of, we can use it. The it in this situation was of course me. I couldn't work out whether or not they were using Mexican slang to suggest that they were going to rob me or whatever, but, but then I got another phrase that really clued me in to what they had in mind. Mulo ciego, one of them said in passing. Blind mule. I had seen enough banged up abroad to know just what they had in mind for me. In all likelihood, they were planning on taking me down to Mexico before hiding drugs on me, then driving me back so they could retrieve them safely. But then they said something that sent a chill down my spine. Comienza a actuar estupido matalo, the passenger said, basically saying if I started kicking off, they'd shoot me. Actually, funny you should mention wanting to go. We're headed across the border to see some family if you want to join us, one of them said, confirming my fears. I remembered telling them I was good, how I only wanted to be taken as far towards Cali as they could take me, but they were insistent, intimidatingly so. I soon realized that if I wanted to get out of there safely, I would have to think fast, and think I did. I began to rub my stomach, making a few queasy noises and generally feigning discomfort until one of the guys in front of me asked me if I was okay. Uh, I had a few tacos back in Arizona City. I lied. I don't think they're sitting right with me. The two guys exchanged a few quiet words in Spanish and decided to ramp it up. Uh, could you guys pull over? I think I'm going to be sick. Don't you puke on my upholstery. The driver shouted not so friendly anymore. It was an Oscar-winning performance, if I do say so myself, and I began to dry wretch so hard that the driver practically slammed on his brakes in order to pull over and let me out. When they finally did, I ran off the road and down an embankment, out of the sight of the two guys, before I began to make the loudest, most dramatic vomiting sounds you could imagine. The act crossed over into reality as I somehow managed to force up some stomach lining, and although I'm not proud of this, I actually smeared some of my face and shirt to make the whole thing look super authentic. The next part is something I'm extremely proud of, though. As the two guys appeared at the top of the embankment and looked down on me in disgust, I held my legs together and kind of shuffled towards them. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think I just... I think I just... I didn't say it, 
I just pointed to the seat of my pants, suggesting a little of the fictional tacos I'd eaten had come out of the other end. Dito asqueroso. One of the guys spat. Disgusting. Wincing as he rushed back towards his car. They didn't say a word to me as they hopped back in and sped off along the highway. Few times in my life have I felt that relieved and I actually danced along that dark stretch of highway for a while once the car was well and truly out of sight. The moral of the story, be bloody careful whose car you get into at the side of a highway. Sometimes it's best just to man up and find that flea-bitten motel than risk your life with members of a cartel. I've seen a few posts in this forum about how it's dangerous to carry a can of gas in your trunk. First of all, that's just nonsense. Unless someone rear-ends you while they're on fire, there's much more risk of an explosion or fire from the gas that's already in your tank. Secondly, the dangers you're putting yourself in by not carrying spare gas far, far outweigh the apparent dangers of doing so. And now I'll tell you why. I used to drive around the country a ton as part of a traveling salesman job. Before my retirement, I was an aluminum siding salesman and, although it was a tough job that kept me away from my family for weeks at a time, it was incredibly financially rewarding, especially the northern states like Nebraska where winter temperatures could drop to dangerous levels. So as you might have guessed, I ended up stuck by the side of the highway one rough winter when I discovered I'd totally forgotten to top my gas can up before my journey. I was furious with myself, but also pretty frightened. The weather was making a turn for the worse and it would be very risky to go looking for a gas station. So, I was forced to hitchhike. The thing about the Midwest is that people can be much, much friendlier than out on the East Coast. Maybe it's those rural sensibilities, but I was on the side of that highway for a lot less time than I had expected when a car pulled over to the verge and a driver enthusiastically invited me to hop in. He told me his name was Conald, a name I'd never heard before, nor since, and the vehicle he was driving was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. He basically turned the thing into a mobile home and the car looked extremely lived in. There were laptop and phone chargers running on battery attachments, all kinds of garbage dumped in the footwells, even a loudspeaker grafted onto the top of the car. I mean, it almost looked like a police cruiser from some post-apocalyptic future. Anyway, I've climbed into this guy's car and I've explained that I need him to drive me to the nearest gas station and back so I can get back on the road. In a raspily gravelly voice, he agrees to help me out and we're on our way. But as soon as we're back on the highway, he starts asking me all kinds of probing questions about my life and my job. When I tell him I'm an aluminum siding salesman, he starts accusing me of trying to trick sweet old ladies out of their pensions for paneling that would have them freezing to death in the winter. Now obviously I took serious offense to this. I wasn't some vulture who preyed on the weak. I took pride in my work, even if it wasn't what I dreamed of doing when I was a kid. Connell backed off a little at this point and actually grumbled an apology through his gritted teeth. He told me that he met a lot of bad people in his life, how he didn't mean anything by it, how he was glad I was one of the good guys. We just dodged this conversational bullet when a gas station finally came into view. Connell pulled off the road where I'd hopped out and headed over to grab a spare can of gas. At first I figured he might just drive off on me and I silently prepared myself for that to be the case. Only he didn't. He stayed, just as he said he would. Yet as I'm walking back to the Connolds vehicle, something catches my eye that has my heart racing. I can see a flame inside the car, small enough to be from some kind of cigarette lighter, but still alarming given that he's using a lighter in a freaking gas station. You want to talk about serious dangers, there's one right there. I crack the car door and I'm about to ask him what he's thinking when I see just exactly what he's doing with the lighter. Connell was burning his own hair. What are you doing, man? I remember asking him in total and utter confusion. Saves money on haircuts, he replied. Here's the thing. 
I could hear the pain in his voice as the flames reached his scalp and fizzled out. Besides, you gotta get it nice and hot when you're feathering it, brother. I was completely at a loss for words. He was literally using a cigarette lighter to style his hair. I asked him again just what he thought he was doing using a lighter at a freaking gas station. He snapped back at me, but I asserted that I was holding a gas canister in my hand and he should put the thing away before I got back in. But that's not even the weirdest thing he did. On the drive back to my car, Connell began to complain about a pain in his tooth. I sympathized a great deal. My daughter had some dental work done that previous year and it had cost us a fortune. That and tooth pain can be terrible at times. I can relate to the story of my daughter's ordeal to him when he began to growl and pull over to the side of the road. He seemed furious and at first I was worried he was going to try and kick me out of the car, right there at the side of the freezing highway. But I never, ever could have anticipated what he did next. Connell reached under the driver's seat and pulled out the biggest hunting knife I'd ever seen in my life. He looked at me, holding the thing tight in his grip, and gave me a wolfish grin. I'm not embarrassed to admit that I was absolutely terrified. The guy was obviously not playing with a full deck, if you catch my meaning, and I slowly prepared to throw myself out of the passenger side if he went for me with the blade. But he didn't. Instead, Connell put the blade into his mouth, and I heard the sharp edge grind against one of his teeth as he bit down on it. I remember desperately wanting to ask him what he was thinking, but the words just wouldn't come out. All I could do was watch as a few drops of blood bubbled up from between his lips and ran down his chin. He was ripping his own freaking tooth out with the blade of the knife. It was horrific, and in the end I couldn't bring myself to watch as he grunted and growled, his raspy voice grinding in agony as he dislodged a tooth with a sickening crunch. Like I said, I wasn't watching, but I listened as he spat the broken tooth out into his palm, rolled down the window, then tossed it out onto the highway. You could have saved a few dollars on your daughter like that, brother, he said, in between spitting out mouthfuls of blood through the open driver's window. Again, I couldn't say a word. I was in utter disbelief at what I'd just seen. Luckily, we rolled up to my gasless car not long after, and, as promised, Connell slowed to a stop and let me out, having helped me get back on the road. I thanked him, genuinely, and all he did was let out this horrifyingly gravelly laugh. It was truly evil-sounding, but, honestly, I don't think that guy meant me any harm at all. He was just manic. I still think about Connell sometimes, and I wonder how he's doing if he's still living in that car and performing self-surgery. But on the off chance he comes across this post somewhere, thank you, Connell. Just please, get some help. My name is Linda Van Nguyen, and I used to be hippie. Well, I still am hippie, I suppose, but back in the day... I used to be a real hippie, the kind that at 18 packed up their belongings and took a trip on a magic bus all the way out to India. I spent the years after that doing a lot of hitchhiking all over Europe and the Middle East, back when it was relatively safe if you can believe that. So naturally, I have a lot of affection for hitchhikers and those that are dangerous enough to give them a ride, and I never failed to stop for those with their thumbs out. This led me to picking up a hitchhiker on a Massachusetts highway one night, a decision I would later come to regret in a huge way. So as I said, I was cruising out of Boston one evening, heading back towards Salem, probably the hippiest place in all of Massachusetts and where I currently call home. There on the side of the highway was a tall man in a long black coat holding out a thumb. I slowed to a stop called out a friendly greeting from an open window, then invited him in to ask him where he was headed. He told me Maine, but he'd be grateful for as far as I could take him, even if that was only towards Salem. It was then I noticed the bag he had with him. It was one of those leather bowling bags, the semi-circular kind with two thin straps. Not unusual on its own, but 
The way he was holding it a little too tightly did attract my attention, but those delicate observations were soon overcome by the outrageous smell that seemed to come off the guy. He absolutely reeked of something rotten, and I was soon glad that I had only promised to take him as far as Salem. I'm not one to judge. I had met plenty of unwashed travelers back in my heyday, but I think he saw the look on my face or the wrinkling of my nose and opted to say something. He told me he was sorry about the smell, and that he'd been on the road a few days and didn't have enough money to pay for a motel room, or anywhere else to get washed for that matter. I told him not to worry, that I'd been in similar situations myself, and it wasn't anything an open window wouldn't remedy. But even with the crack driver's window, the stench persisted, until I'd pretty much resigned myself to mouth-breathing for the rest of the short journey. At one point, I got pretty concerned about the man's well-being. Certain kinds of infections, such as gangrene, can cause hideous odors as they rot away at whatever flesh it has purchase of. If he was a drug user and he'd picked up something like that from sharing needles, he had to be in some sort of pain. But when I threw out a vague question inquiring about his health, he seemed confused. He told me he was a picture of health, how maybe he could do with putting on a few pounds, but... Other than that, he was peachy keen. I was almost certain I'd saw him limping a little as he climbed into the passenger side, but still, I decided not to press the issue. Offending your passenger does not make for a pleasant journey. Anyway, we arrive in Salem, and as much as I try not to show it, I was over the moon that we were parting ways. But the rotten smell seemed to cling to my car's upholstery, no matter how much Febreze I pumped in there, and I actually ended up spending the majority of that evening scrubbing the passenger side with a mix of disinfectant and hand soap. It was the first time I'd ever actually felt regret about picking up a hitchhiker, and it was deeply confusing for me. I hated feeling like a Grinch who was angry she'd been generous enough to help out another human being, but all of those emotions paled in comparison to the next morning when I told my partner what had happened the previous evening. I knew something was wrong the moment I mentioned picking up a hitchhiker. My partner gave me this look, one I'd only ever seen once or twice throughout our entire relationship. It was one of pure fear. I started asking her why she was looking at me like that, what she knew that I didn't. All she did was flick through the newspaper she was reading over breakfast, pointing out a certain article that consisted of no more than one or two paragraphs. It detailed a story of a prisoner escape down in New York State, how a tall, boyish prisoner had managed to slip through the cracks thanks to some kind of paroling error. New York State troopers had urged members of the public to keep an eye out for a tall, thin man who walked with a limp. The article went on to say that the prisoner was most likely headed up to the Canadian border in a bid to escape justice. I had given that prisoner a ride. My partner immediately called the cops while I called into work to let them know I might be a little late that day. A pair of uniformed officers arrived at our home with lightning speed, desperate to write down as many details as I could remember. What he was wearing, what he was carrying, where I dropped him off, where he said he was going. I could only answer so many of their questions, but I had a few of my own. I told them about the terrible smell, the stench that had clung to my upholstery and was likely still lingering. I wanted to know what would make a man smell that terrible if he had some kind of disease he hadn't mentioned. Honestly, I was terrified that if he did, it would be contagious. After all, I'd spent the better part of an hour in a car with this guy. They told me no, that he wasn't sick, but that they could explain the smell, although it might be something that I didn't want to know. I told them of course I wanted to know what it was. I'd been in a car with the murderer and lived to tell the tale. It was with this horrible look in the officer's eyes that he told me that bad smell could well have come from the fact that the escapee had visited someone in Buffalo, New York, before he made it into Massachusetts. Someone that he'd taken a trophy from. Potentially their bloody, severed head. I am never hitchhiking again. I mean it. As long as I live, I will never, 
ever get into a car with a stranger that hasn't got an Uber or Lyft tag on the passenger door. The moment I decided to try to hitch, I knew it was a bad idea. I told myself I shouldn't be doing it and, hey, what do you know? I was right. I think that's why I've been beating myself up so bad about it. I knew it was a terrible idea, I knew the risks, and I did it anyway. So please read my story and remember it every time you think you can save a few dollars on a taxi by thumbing a lift. So every night when I finished my waitressing shift, I had to catch a bus out of downtown Detroit all the way out to Royal Oak where I live with my mom. Sometimes, depending on how late I finish, I have to catch the last bus. I mean the very last bus on the line. It's either that, spend my tips on an Uber, fat chance, or walk. And there's no walking anywhere in Detroit come wintertime. So, I'm on the bus one night, the very last bus, pleased to be headed back to a nice warm bed after a long, hard shift. I have my headphones on, listening to some murder podcasts when I hear like a pop behind me, muffled by the sounds of the podcaster's chatter. I turn to see the seats behind me covered in broken safety glass with a football-sized hole in the bus's window. Some total idiot had thrown a rock through the bus window. Some people are just animals, and sure it was kind of scary, but not nearly as scary as what was about to happen with our bus driver. A few hundred meters further down the road, the bus pulls over to another stop. Only I see the driver say something to the passenger who wants to embark, something that makes the passenger shake his head in frustration before walking away. I suspect the worst pulling out a headphone to hear my suspicions confirmed. Sorry, I can't go any further. I heard him say. It's a safety issue. Can't go any further. Sorry. I'm beyond furious at this point, as I'm walking to get off the bus, wondering what I'm going to do about getting home. The driver starts trying to explain the same thing to me. I just nod, staying polite. I knew it wasn't his fault, but still, I was angry. I pull my phone out, order an Uber, which gets immediately cancelled by the driver. I have no idea why, I have an almost perfect rating. So I try again and again and again, and realize this might be the only night ever where I was unable to get a freaking taxi. It was about then that the idea of hitching occurred to me. I'd freeze my boobs off if I just stood there at that last bus shelter, gambling on an Uber deciding it wasn't worth braving the freezing temperatures for what was little more than a $10 fare. So I did it. I stuck my thumb out, staring down, approaching headlights in the hope that somehow, someone would find it in their heart to stop for me. Eventually someone did, and to my infinite relief, he looked perfectly normal and was an exceptionally well-mannered individual. Hi there. Everything all right? The man asked through the open window of his car. He wore glasses and a steel gray shirt and tie combo. He looked like the most unthreatening person in the history of unthreatening people. Yeah, but my ride... I said and pointed mournfully towards the bus that was now flashing its hazard lights. I think I was too shy to ask at first, but when the guy just opened the passenger door for me and flashed a smile, I thought I was saved but I couldn't have been more wrong. The guy was nice enough at first. He asked how my day was, asked what I did for a living, you know, small talk. Yet he seemed to take issue with the fact my waitressing shifts seemed to end so late. Funny, I don't know any waitressing jobs that finish so late, he said, skeptically at one point. I was confused, I mean, plenty of restaurants finish late, some are open 24 hours. I had absolutely no idea where this guy was getting the idea from, but there was no way I was about to call him dumb or ignorant. He had, after all, been nice enough to pull over for me when I was in need. Well, you don't strike me as ever having been a waitress, no offense. I said, deciding on a pretty weak dad joke to lighten the mood. But it didn't work. In fact, it only seemed to make him agitated. I'd never been a waitress, no, but I'm definitely not dumb, young lady. Instantly his tone changes and my skin crawls when he calls me young lady. I suddenly begin to realize that he didn't pull over out of the kindness of his heart. He pulled over out of some sense of possessiveness, and I didn't like that at all. Admit it. 
he continued. You're not a waitress, and you weren't on that bus. Excuse me? I know your game, and I'm not going to let you rob me. He seemed to growl, and after that he began to drive faster. I swore on my grandma I wasn't out to rob anyone. I even pointed frantically at my waitressing uniform, pleading with him to calm and slow down. But he didn't. He just kept speeding up until soon he was driving so fast that he had to weave in and out of traffic to keep going. Other cars were honking at him, obviously disturbed by such dangerous driving. But that paled in comparison to what I was feeling. The raw terror had tears pulling in my eyes. Please, I'm not going to rob anyone, I just want to go home. I sobbed. You got a gun in that purse, don't you? Don't you? All I could do was cry and shake my head. Every muscle in my body was tensed, braced for the deadly impact I felt would come at any moment. Will you just try it, Missy? I'll crash this car and kill us both. You hear me? I'll kill us both before you take a single cent off of me. I have never, ever been so completely relieved to see red and blue lights flashing behind me. It was just nuts. The guy actually pulled over and told the traffic cop that he was just trying to stop himself from being robbed. When the cop asked who was trying to rob him, and the psycho points to the weeping waitress on the passenger side, i.e. me, the cop looks horrified and tells him to get out of the car. What should have been a 40-minute journey home turned into three full hours of terror, confusion, and finally a police interview. The cops wanted to press kidnapping charges on the guy, which I feel like he kind of deserved. But since I admitted to getting in the car on my own free will, all they could stick on him was a dangerous driving charge. But the damage has been done, and I hope you'll learn from my mistake. Always, always take your Ubers. In February of 2013, Jessup Reisbeck, an employee of Fox News Fresno affiliate KMPH, found himself at the scene of an automobile accident. There, he and his cameraman found themselves interviewing a young man who had been at the center of the incident. Sporting long hair, along with a red jumper and gray bandana, the young man, who gave his name as Kai, described in some detail the horrific events that unfolded as he'd been hitchhiking. Kai told the news crew how he'd been hitchhiking through California when he was picked up by a man named Jet Simmons McBride. At first, conversation had remained neutral, but Kai was soon disturbed to discover that Jet Simmons McBride referred to himself as the incarnation of Jesus Christ and that he could do anything he wanted to. Needless to say, Kai suddenly felt very unsafe in the passenger seat as he was evidently someone with some serious mental health issues. What's more, McBride would not be easily overpowered if it came to a struggle, as he was a 300-pound behemoth. However, things went from bad to worse when McBride made a frank admission to Kai. McBride told the young hitchhiker that he was a businessman who regularly traveled the globe to ply his trade. He told him that he had been to places where the U.S. dollar could buy you things that were categorically unavailable back home in America, things like underage girls. Kai was forced to listen as McBride told him the tale of how he had his way with a 14-year-old girl while staying in the Virgin Islands. He gleefully explained that the girl was hesitant to lay with him, but that he'd gotten what he'd paid for in the end. Yet as McBride reveled in revealing such awful details to the young hitchhiker, he became distracted and took his eyes off the road. That's when the traffic accident occurred. McBride's vehicle struck another, sending it careening into the path of an unsuspecting pedestrian who was violently pinned against a truck. KMPH later discovered that McBride deliberately targeted the pinned pedestrian because he was black. Screams of agony rang out as Kai jumped into action. He threw himself out of McBride's crash vehicle with the intention of helping the pin pedestrian. Other bystanders also sprang into action, rushing over to the scene of the crash in order to help save lives. However, when one smaller woman arrived on the scene and attempted to dial 911 on her cell phone, a crazed Jet Simmons McBride burst from the driver's side, 
grab hold of the woman in a bear hug and began to suffocate her. Kai later described hearing the woman gasping for breath, meekly fighting back against McBride who was no doubt attempting to kill her. He could have snapped her neck like a pencil stick, he later says to the camera. Kai knew he had to do something. He unshouldered his backpack and took out a hatchet he kept for self-defense. With the handle tight in his grip, Kai began to strike McBride repeatedly in the back of the head with the axe blade. Over and over and over again, he sent the blunt blade into the back of McBride's skull until eventually he let go of the woman he was in the process of suffocating and began to stagger away with blood pouring from the back of his head. Yet unbelievably, the 300-pound Jet Simmons McBride was still able to stagger away from the scene despite the immense amount of blood loss he had suffered. There was no doubt that he was in the middle of some kind of psychotic episode as he was later found pleasuring himself at a nearby middle school before being taken into custody by local police. About the same time the video footage of Kai describing the attack goes viral, he is also taken into custody by police. Yet after a brief interrogation, Kai is released and hailed as a hero by the general public. Hundreds of thousands are endeared to him as they watch him frantically describe his defense of the near suffocated woman. I was like smash, he explains, describing himself hitting McBride with his hatchet. Smash, smash, smash. Kai's brush with fame led to brief meetings with Jimmy Kimmel, who actually featured Kai himself on his show, telling his audience, he should never pick up hitchhikers except for that one. Yet in the midst of the otherwise comical footage that was seen by possibly millions of people, there are a few details that in hindsight shed a little light on just who was being interviewed. When asked what his second name was, Kai replies, Don't have one. I don't have anything. When asked where he was from, Kai replies, Sophia, West Virginia. When asked how old he is, Kai replies, Can't call it. Why would a person be so reluctant to reveal such personal details but so willing to tell people where he's from? That's because Kai was not, in fact, from Sophia, West Virginia. That was a bold-faced lie. He is actually from Canada. Yet there are many more inconsistencies in Kai's life than merely his distorted version of his origins. In May of 2013, an entire continent away from Fresno, California, a New Jersey lawyer was murdered in his home brutally beaten to death with a blunt object. New Jersey police released details regarding a person of interest related to the case. Those that saw the viral video a few months prior would have been astounded when they saw the face of who was now wanted for such a hideous crime. It was the face of Kai, the hitchhiker. Kai was arrested at a Philadelphia Starbucks after a barista recognized him from his wanted poster. The public then became painfully aware of Kai's lies when it was revealed that he was being detained at Immigration and Customs Enforcement Facility after authorities determined he was in the U.S. illegally. Kai maintained he fought against the New Jersey lawyer Joseph Golfi in self-defense. According to statements he'd given to police, Golfi attempted to force himself upon him after offering Kai a place to stay for the night. Kai stated that the police claimed that the encounter was consensual and the murder premeditated. However, Kai said that after the viral video in California, he had no need to be with men like Galfi, who Kai described as unattractive, stating, Do you know how many hot chicks? Never mind. Even if I was gay, do you know how many hot guys wanted to screw me after that stuff in California? I'm not even being vain. It's just a fact, like, no offense, but he was not a looker. After the murder charges, the video's views increased substantially, increasing its viral reach. Fans of the video, who considered Kai an innocent hero for saving the woman back in Fresno, began to crowdfund his illegal fees. But when the jury was asked to decide on charges of self-defense or murder, evidence presented to them overwhelmingly pointed towards outright murder. Kai took to the stand in his own defense and was combative during cross-examination, he made an outburst during his defense lawyer's closing arguments nearly leading to expulsion from the courtroom. A jury found him guilty of first-degree murder and he was sentenced to 57 years in prison. He will serve 85% of that term before the possibility of parole, with the judge telling Kai, or his real name, 
Caleb Lawrence McGilvery. When you become eligible for parole, you will still be younger than Mr. Golfi was when you murdered him, who was 73 at the time. Kai's story goes to show you just how a person can go from hero to villain, all in the swing of an axe. Sonoma County, California is one of the most agriculturally productive areas in the entire country. It produces a huge amount of hops, grapes, prunes, apples, dairy, and poultry products every single year. This is down to the vast swaths of fertile land in addition to the abundance of high-quality irrigation water. In addition to the vineyards and wineries that call Sonoma home, one might mistake the county for being a little slice of paradise. But during the early 1970s, a series of horrifying events in the hills around Sonoma's largest city, Santa Rosa, would make this heavenly place seem more like a circle of hell. On February 4th, 1972, two middle school friends were returning from a visit to the Redwood Empire Ice Arena. Maureen Louise Sterling and Yvonne Lisa Weber, both 12 years old, were last seen around 9 p.m., hitchhiking on Guernaville Road, northeast of Santa Rosa. Neither of the girls arrived home that night. Their parents begged local authorities to find their girls, and find them they did. Their bodies were found December 28th, just a few miles north of Franz Valley Road. A single earring, orange beads, and a 14-carat gold necklace with cross were found at the scene. The cause of death could not be determined from the skeletal remains. Then just a month later, 19-year-old art student Kim Wendy Allen was given a ride by two men on the evening of March 4, 1972. They last saw her at approximately 5.20 p.m., hitchhiking to school and carrying a large wooden soy barrel with red Chinese characters on it. Her body was found the following day down an embankment in a creek bed. The two men who gave her a ride one of whom was given and passed a polygraph test, were ruled out as suspects. This pattern of hitchhiker murders was repeated over and over again as the years went by, but only a handful had modus operandi that matched the previous murders. One in particular had an extremely disturbing additional detail that may shed some light on who the murderer or murderers were. Carolyn Nadine Davis, 14 years old, ran away from her home outside Anderson and Shasta County on February 6, 1973, but disappeared July 15th after being dropped off by her grandmother at the Garberville Post Office. She was last seen hitchhiking that afternoon near the highway in Garberville. Her body was discovered on July 31st just meters from where the remains of Sterling and Weber had been recovered seven months prior. However, this time, the cause of death could be determined and coroners stated that it was an obvious case of strychnine poisoning, 10 to 14 days before the body was discovered. A witchcraft symbol meaning carrier of spirits was found by her body. As was previously mentioned, an additional eight unsolved murders of female victims have been linked to the unknown murderer, yet not a single conviction had been handed down in connection with any of them. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't a few prevailing theories on the murderer's true identity. Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Buono Jr., the Hillside Stranglers of Los Angeles, were seriously considered as suspects at one point. The Hillside Strangler murders began with the deaths of three escorts who were found strangled and dumped naked on hillsides northeast of Los Angeles between October and early November 1977. It was not until the deaths of five young women who were not escorts, but girls who had been abducted from middle-class neighborhoods, that the media attention and subsequent Hillside Strangler moniker came to prominence. However, there was insufficient evidence to link either Bianchi or Buono to the Sonoma County murders, so we must look elsewhere for conclusive proof. Another suspect in the case was Frederick Manali, a 41-year-old Santa Rosa Junior College creative writing instructor. In August of 1976, Manali was involved in a fatal head-on collision on Highway 12. A CHP officer cleared the scene, but they discovered something extremely disturbing. In addition to a large amount of creative writing work Manali had in his possession, 
police discovered that the instructor cultivated another form of creativity, drawing. But these weren't still life for landscape drawings. They were scenes depicting sadomasochistic acts committed on a young woman. Investigators were easily able to identify the woman in question from the quality of the sketches. It was Kim Wendy Allen, the second victim in the series of murders. Yet despite searches of Manali's home, investigators were unable to find a credible link between the sketches and murders themselves. Another suspect in the case was none other than the subject of a recent Netflix-made movie, Ted Bundy. After the prolific murderer's capture of similar crimes in Washington, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho, Ted Bundy was heavily suspected as the Sonoma County Hitchhiker Killer. The links between the naked bodies and the Sonoma victims and the extreme venereal nature of Bundy's crimes were obvious. It turned out that Bundy had indeed spent time in the neighboring Marin County, but was ruled out by a Sonoma County detective in the 1970s and again in 1989. This was down to detailed credit card records that revealed Bundy was all the way up the coast in Washington State on the dates of some of the disappearances. An additional suspect in the murders is another famous name, the Zodiac Killer. Investigators were forced to consider the Zodiac Killer as a possible perpetrator due to similarities between an unknown symbol on his January 29, 1974 exorcist letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, in which he claims 37 victims and the Chinese characters on the missing soy barrel carried by Kim Allen. Also, the Zodiac had written a letter delivered to the San Francisco Chronicle on November 9, 1969. In it, he stated an intention to vary his modus operandi in an attempt to confuse detectives and thus evade capture. I shall no longer announce to anyone when I commit my murders. They shall look like routine robberies, killings of anger plus a few fake accidents, etc. Naturally, the consideration of the Zodiac Killer leads us to one Arthur Lee Allen. Allen owned a mobile home at Sunset Trailer Park in Santa Rosa at the time of the murders. He had also been fired from his Valley Springs Elementary School teaching position for suspected inappropriate touching of children in 1968, Allen was arrested on September 27, 1974 by the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office for that exact charge in an unrelated case involving another young boy. He pleaded guilty on March 14, 1975 and was in prison at Atascadero State Hospital until late 1977. This would indeed match the time period for some of the murders. What's more, Robert Gray Smith in his book Zodiac Unmasked claims that a Sonoma County Sheriff revealed that chipmunk hairs were found on all of the Santa Rosa hitchhikers' victims and that Allen had been collecting and studying the same species. It would be possible that since the bodies were dumped outdoors that a few chipmunk hairs might be present on one or two of them, but all of them seems like far more than just a coincidence. Allen was the main suspect in the Zodiac case for more than 30 years, until his DNA was compared to a partial DNA profile obtained from saliva recovered on the underside of a postage stamp and envelopes from verified Zodiac letters. Results were a conclusive non-match. Fingerprints and blood recovered from the taxicab of Zodiac murder victim Paul Stein, a writer's palm print found on the Zodiac letter of January 29, 1974, and handwriting examples failed to identify Allen as the Zodiac. In practice, this evidence would have exonerated Allen should he had ever stood trial for the charges, so we are essentially forced to look elsewhere for clues to the murderer's identity. But given that almost 50 years later, each murder remains distinctly clear, just who was murdering hitchhikers in the hills around Santa Rosa? Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly, and if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. 
located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, cucumbers are just pickles and training. <laughs>